Welcome, I'm Madeline DiNono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. With me, as always, is our esteemed ASL interpreter, Gabe Gomez. Please remember to pin Gabe's video if you would like to keep him on screen throughout the entire event. And if you would like to see the closed captioning, please make sure to turn that on at the bottom of your screen. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that in Los Angeles, we are currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash peoples. I want to recognize that we are all connected with one another and that the ground beneath my feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. We wanna thank our partners at Nat Geo for their support. And today I have the privilege of having with us award-winning executive producer, uh, correspondent Mariana Van Zeller. Please remember to post your questions in the Q&A. Lisa Emery, who's our Director of Digital Media, will be watching for your questions. And before we begin, uh, I would like to welcome Gina Davis, Founder and Chair of the Institute. Thank you everyone for joining us here today. And thank you to Mariana for being here. Like the Institute, Mariana's work focuses on supplying proof to accelerate systemic change. Mariana, we look forward to hearing about your experiences shooting the second season of Trafficked and what it was like gaining access to these never before seen worlds. What inspired you to pursue journalism and what advice you can give to young women joining us here today who are looking to pursue a career in journalism. Thank you all again for being here today. Thanks, Gina. And before we get started, we would love to show all of you a trailer from season two. So let's roll the trailer. Is that your security guard behind you? The gun behind you? Doesn't have a gun. That's not a gun? What is it? I won't ask you again, then. They'll hurt you when they have to. They or you? As a journalist, if I'm trying to get into these clubs and see how they operate... I would say good luck. It's the military. They're covering their faces, which is never good. How often is it that you have cameras filming? Never. Do you think there's a, a race war coming? I hope so. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it all my life. I'll do it till I'm laid in the casket. It seems to me like there's a fire spreading. Do you think it's too late to stop this? Well, everybody involved is making money. So it goes really deep. You work with the cartel? I might have seen up there. Do you trust these people? So they look at you as prey. If you want to kill you, ask some questions. So the whole we gotta move, we gotta move. The black market will be here as long as the legal market keeps screwing up. The trailer gives me the goosies, as they may say. It's so thrilling. So Mariana, we will definitely get into uh, season two, but I wanted to start off with what I will call the origin story. And there are so many things that were so fascinating uh, about your background. And one story I would love uh, for you to share with our audience is how you actually got into uh, Columbia, because we always talk about getting a seat at the table and breaking barriers, but for a lot of our audience who may be younger in their career. Uh, I would love for you to tell that story. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Madeline, first and foremost. Uh, you, it, started, it all started actually back when I was 12 years old and I decided I wanted to be a journalist. And it was because I used to watch the nightly news with my family in Portugal, where I grew up. Every night it was mandatory viewing. And I was all, I've always been fascinated and very curious about the world. And I would just watch these anchors on Portuguese television talking about the whole world with just so much memory and, and so much knowledge. And they seem to have memorized everything all the facts and all the cities and and 
I had no idea they were reading from a teleprompter, but that was the moment, okay, this is it. I want to be a journalist. And then I started researching and I realized that the best uh, journalism school in the world is Columbia University grad school. And so I started applying. I graduated from school in Portugal and immediately started applying to Columbia University. And I applied the first year and I didn't get in. And the second year I was put on a wait list, but I didn't get in. And so the third year, even though they completely discouraged international students from going to the school, I flew to New York and I knocked on the Dean's door and I introduced myself and that year uh, I was accepted. I basically told him why I wanted to go to that school and why I so desperately wanted to be a journalist. Now, did you just march in there? Did, were you able to set up an appointment? I mean, that <laughs> takes a lot of chutzpah, as we would say. Uh, I just in. I marched in. I marched in. I went to the school. I went to New York. Uh, because I was, I decided, okay, I, I'm not going to let this happen again. There can't be a third time that I'm not uh, admit, admitted into this university. So I, my, I didn't really have a plan. I knew I wanted to go to New York and I know I wanted to go visit the school. And I was hoping that maybe I would see somebody, a teacher, and I could talk to them. Um, but that didn't happen. So I'm walking around and then I thought, well, I'm here already. So I'm just going to go up. I asked where the dean's office was and I literally knocked on his door. And he, I was lucky because he happened to be there because he happened to be an amazing human being, Professor Dean David Claytel, who I will never forget. And he sat me down and we spoke for an hour and he asked me all sorts of questions about journalism and about my life and why I wanted to be a journalist. And a few months later, I got a call and I was in the newsroom in Portugal uh, with my first TV job when I got a call from a Columbia saying I'd gotten in and I cried so many tears of joy and I called my mother who was also crying and that was sort of the, the beginning of uh, this crazy wild ride that I've been on. Such a great story, such a great story. And so now, now you're uh, in New York and of course, a very interesting time. Can you talk about what it was like you're in New York 30 days and 9-11 hits. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. You know, I was still sort of getting to know the city. I'd never lived uh, in New York. Um, I was, you know, going, walking around and looking around the city and thinking, I cannot believe that this is actually happening. That it, I'm living my dream. And then one morning I had stayed up until really late at night working on an assignment for Columbia University. I was 24 years old, completely inexperienced as a journalist. And I got a call from the TV station I'd worked for in, in Portugal telling me that uh, this huge event had just happened. I started getting all these phone calls, but I was just trying to sleep because I'd been up until 4 a.m. The, the night before. And eventually when I answered the phone, they tell me, look, this has happened, turn on your TV. And I turn it on and I see the second tower collapsing and I have my mother who's calling me on the other line. So I'm talking to both of them at the same time. And I have the television station telling me, go to Midtown. You're the only Portuguese journalist we know in Manhattan at the time. Go to Midtown and you were going to report live on the events of what's happening today, which was 9-11. And uh, I had my mother on the other line screaming and yelling and crying and begging me not to leave my house because Man Manhattan for all we knew was unsafe. And I had to tell her, mom, I, I'm sorry, but this is this is what I want to do. But this is why I came to New York. Uh, and so I did. I ran down to uh, to Midtown and I did my first live reporting. I remember being incredibly nervous and thinking, this is it. This is the test that will tell me if I am, in fact, made to be a journalist or not. But I was able to do it. Um, you know, I did my report. I talked. I was the first face that a lot that most people, Portuguese people turned on and saw on the news that day. Um, and I remember there's this moment of sort of happiness after I did that on my part. I thought, I did it. I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to be able to be a journalist. And then it all, all came crashing down the moment I walked out onto the streets and I started seeing, I still get super emotional every time I talk about this, but when I started seeing the symbol signs with posters of people looking for their loved ones. And it's very silly, but I always get emotional talking about this. But for me, it was a, a sort of a, a realization that, yeah, this is a much bigger story. Obviously, it's not about me. It's about this horrific event that just happened. There's so many people suffering around me and I need to figure out why. Um, you know, the kind of journalism that I wanna do and I decided at that moment is a journalism that asks the very important question of why and who, who are the people behind these attacks? And so a year later, I moved to the Middle East. I moved to Syria, the war in Iraq had just started. 
and I enrolled in the University of Damascus. And the first story I did uh, was about, as a freelance journalist, was about the Mujahideen, the foreign fighters that were crossing into Iraq to fight against the Americans. Um, and that was, again, the beginning of my coverage of black markets around the world. It's just so, so deep, deeply uh, moving. So I want to move more deeply into what I'm going to call um, your secret sauce. But I mean, you speak five languages, you know, fluently. So how did that inform how you, A, you think about the world, mm -hmm. and B, how that allows you to consider and engage in such a broad spectrum of topics that someone who only speaks English or maybe only speaks Portuguese wouldn't be able to do that. So did you grow up speaking all those languages or did you say, hey, this needs to be part of my secret sauce in my toolkit? <laughs> Uh, I've always been interested in languages. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, I speak five, I don't speak any of them very well. <laughs> That's what I usually say. Uh, I went to an English school growing up in Portugal, so that helped me tremendously. And then, um, you know, I think we are privileged in Europe with the fact that uh, you, you, the languages that we speak, such as Portuguese growing up, are not widely available all around the world, even though Portuguese is the fifth most spoken language in the world. Most people don't know that. Um, but there's a lot of people when you're traveling that don't speak your language, so it sort of forces people to learn other languages, and I've always been interested. I lived in Italy, and I've traveled, traveled extensively throughout uh, countries where French and Spanish is spoken, uh, and once you know one Latin language or two, the others are sort of easier to learn. However, I did try to learn Arabic, and at the time I knew how to speak a little bit conversational Arabic when I was living in Syria, but it's a lot harder, and, uh, and eventually I had to leave Syria, so I, I never fully learned it. I do think, however, it is an enormous uh, benefit and a tool uh, that you can have. And I tell everybody that it is, I think, one of the most important things you can give your child, if you can, is language education. And if you can, start learning a language soon, early on enough, because it does, the world seems uh, smaller uh, in a good way. You seem to be able to connect with people. Um, you know, nothing substitutes being able to talk to a person in their own language. Uh, there's an immediate connection there and an understanding of not only the person, but the whole culture through a language. Uh, and so it's helped me tremendously in the reporting and the work that I do. So I want to pick up the thread of what you said about connecting with people. And uh, there's a few words that come to mind, uh, compassion, empathy, and building bridges. So can you talk about how those three elements kind of fall into this secret sauce of how you prepare yourself and, and how you think about approaching these topics? Absolutely. I think that is my the most important tool uh, that I carry with me everywhere is empathy. Um, I make it very much a sort of central tenet of the reporting that I do. Um, I approach every subject matter, every person I interview with empathy first and judgment last. And I tell people this. I tell them I'm here to listen to your stories. Um, I'm not interested in judging you. Um, I'm here because I really do want to place myself in your shoes. And I think that is one of the most powerful and beautiful things about documentary filmmaking at large is the fact that through images, we are allowed to, for a few brief moments in a day, to place ourselves in the shoes of people that we think at first glance we have nothing in common with. And I think that's very powerful and important. And so I, I try to do that with every subject matter. Uh, and it's mostly, you know, sometimes easy and sometimes not. Um, you know, when we did a story about white supremacists, that wasn't an easy thing to do, to find some empathy or compassion for people who are inciting violence and hate um, is not easy at all. Um, but I do think that in general, in a show the, the, like the show I do about black markets around the world where access is key, um, it has really helped me gain access to this world. The fact that, again, I'm there to listen to people's stories and to try to understand them. And so and we'll come back to some specific um, questions about the stories, but you know, clearly you have a team. And so how do you define what's too dangerous? How do you and your team, and I'd love to hear about your team mm -hmm. also, um, how do you assess risk? And what's two for? 
Mm -hmm. I have an incredible team. Uh, we're usually six people on, on the ground traveling, but I have a larger team of other producers, directors, assistant production, all of it uh, in, a, in an office here in LA or working actually all over the country remotely nowadays. Um, but it is, you know, it's, we can't, because it is a risky, risky world and we put ourselves in dangerous situations um, a lot of times, we have to be able, we have to make sure constantly that everybody's on board, that everybody that is out in the field is on board. So we travel, it's myself, usually a director, a producer, and then three people from the camera department, an amazing camera uh, DP, director of photography, a camera operator, also incredibly talented, and a, an AC um, assistant camera sound person. So we're six. And I think this is important because um, you know, we do want to have a high quality of cinematography and I think you can show and that's what's so amazing about this show is that it looks beautiful it looks like a Hollywood movie, but made with you know a tiny minority a tiny amount of people compared to Hollywood movies and a tiny amount of resources. But it does look beautiful. Um, but at the same time, we can't really have more people because we are, you know, a small foot footprint is also important. Um, but we're constantly reevaluating the fear and the risk when we're we're on the in the field. It's not just about me um, not being afraid of a situation or thinking that it's completely safe. I need to make sure that my whole team feels the same way. Um, so yeah, it's we're constantly having huddles and conversations about what we're doing. And have you had situations where you've had to walk away from a story because of the risk? Yes, uh, many. I mean, um, we've had situations where there are certain scenes that we just think aren't worth it because it's too risky, or even bigger than that, we've had situations where a whole story that we were about to leave and go film the next day um, turned out to be too risky and we were getting information that we shouldn't be going. And so we had to cancel that story. And um, one of the things I also heard you talk about is that, you know, we always talk about um, bias against women, but you had said that you felt that your gender actually helped you um, in this case. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you are very unique in the world of this type of journalism and reporting. Yeah, I always say that I love to use gender bias to my own advantage, and I do, <laughs> you know, I'm often the only woman uh, surrounded by masked and armed men um, in a world that where gender bias and excess sexism exists, um, yeah, you know, all around us, uh, which is black markets. Um, and uh, I think that one of the reasons why I see it as an advantage to me is because I'm often underestimated. Um, I'm often seen as less threatening. Um, I think most people, when they agree to talk to me, when most men, when they agree to talk to me, uh, they aren't expecting um, the hard questions that I ask, or they are think they think that if I tell her this, maybe she will be scared because she is a woman. Uh -huh. um, and I love to be underestimated um, because it has worked in my favor always. We're seen as less threatening as women. But on the other hand, I also think that there's a very female characteristic, which is again, empathy. It is something that we as women have um, in loads. We have lots of it. We have lots of empathy. We see the world in a much more empathetic way, I think, than men do. Um, we're constantly trying to understand uh, instead, instead of judging or to, 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 again, to place ourselves in people's, ourselves in people's shoes. Uh, and so again, that, that has really has helped me tremendously. And also compassion, again, a very, very, very female characteristic um, that I think is incredibly important for the work that I do. So I want to now go back to and spend some time walking through some of these um, episodes. So one of the comments you had said is, and you had said it here also, people we consider our enemies are much more similar to us than we'd like to believe. And um, I'd love for you to you know, talk about that thematically because that is um, a, a, a thread you know, for all of these um, episodes. And also the debate, you know, aside from the risk, it's you're giving people also a platform. Is there a boomerang? effect in a way. So if you could just talk about that um, from a, you know, from a sociological standpoint. Yeah, I think most people when they, uh, 
most people I think would assume that by doing a show about black markets, about the underworld, by meeting all these criminals and outlaws and traffickers, that I would probably have a very depressing and dark view of the world, but it's actually quite the opposite. What I have found uh, through almost 20 years of covering black markets is that even when you travel to the extremes of our society to meet these criminals and these outlaws, that you can still find people that you relate to and that are have characteristics that are redeemable um, and that I am capable of connecting and that I'm hoping my viewers will also be able to connect with them because I do think that the power is, of connection is should never be underestimated. Unless you are able to connect with somebody, um, you, are, you won't care. So to, to, to care, you have to be able to connect and to be able to make changes in the world and want to, to make it a better place, you have to be able to care. Um, so all of these are interconnected. And for me, what I've discovered in my reporting is that that connection is not difficult, that even these people that we think are very, very different from us that live in very, you know, maybe far away locations and doing things that we would never even think for a second of doing, that at the end of the day, they are very similar to us, that they also have family members, mothers, fathers, children, um, that they also have dreams and aspirations and goals, and that the vast majority of times it is because of a lack of opportunity and inequality uh, that people fall into a life of crime, not always, but the vast majority of times. And can you talk a little bit about, you know, you are giving a platform and, and, so it's, you know, the good news and bad news of giving a platform, particularly when we, when you think about white supremacy, can you talk a little bit about what you go through in your head? I like that you brought up white supremacy in this case, because I was going to talk about that here as well. I think there's two things. The first one is that we can think about black markets as perhaps, you know, these are trafficking networks and they're criminals and why do they matter and why should we be doing stories about them? How does this affect me? Well, actually the global economy, half of the global economy operates in these black and gray markets. So half of the world's population more or less is employed or works under these sort of black and gray markets. They have a huge impact on our lives, whether we know it or not. Something like the drug trade alone brings in between 400 to $600 billion a year. And yet, you know, you turn on your television or you open up a newspaper and magazine and you will find everything, you can find any news about any uh, organization or any, you know, the GDP of any country. And yet, you know, so very little about these massive organizations that are bringing in more money than the vast majority of countries, which is crazy. Um, and what we're doing with traffic is not only showing you how they operate, but we're doing it from the inside. We're seeing how the trafficking networks operate. We're meeting the people that are operating in these trafficking networks. And that to me is incredibly important. There are moments, however, when we're approaching subjects like white supremacy, uh, where you do as a journalist have to think of the responsibility that you have. And that is the question that always comes to mind. Am I giving these people a platform and am I allowing them to spread their hateful ideology in this case? Um, am I being a tool for them uh, to spread their message? And is that, am I doing, and should I be doing that or not? And, you know, I was doing actually a story about the growth of white supremacy and neo-Nazi movements during the first Barack Obama election in 2008. And I spent that night with my husband, who's also a journalist, the two of us in a place here in Southern California, watching the election surrounded by neo-Nazis. And the amount of hate uh, that I saw that day, um, when we went back home, um, we realized that this is not the time for a story like this, because this is a time of hope. This is a time where this historic thing has happened, where we elected our first black president. And, uh, and I didn't feel, and neither did my husband feel that it was a time to tell the story about white supremacy. However, what happened is that it didn't go away. And just because the media didn't pay attention to it at the time, um, it didn't disappear. Quite the contrary, it continued growing to the points where now we have, you know, some of the biggest, uh, the white supremacy has risen tremendously and it is now connected, white supremacist groups here and individuals are connected to a larger organization and trafficking networks uh, of white supremacy all around the world. Um, and that's pretty scary. And so we went back and reevaluated. And uh, for this season, we did a whole episode devoted to white supremacy. And, and can you talk a little bit about, um, 
the global networking of white supremacy, because I think we may have thought about it being in pockets and in places in the US, but, yeah. but to hear, and, and also, can you layer in the impact of, of the pandemic Absolutely. on all of these black markets? Can you talk about that as well? Yeah, 100%. So we started filming season two of Traffic in June of 2020. So it was almost at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, a few months in. And what we noticed immediately was that there had been an explosion in black markets, whether it was guns or drugs or scamming. Um, so we knew that this it was uh, the right time to continue doing uh, doing a show like this, that it was actually more relevant than ever. Um, you know, and it doesn't uh, it's understandably why it is understandable why this is happening whenever there's an economic downturn. Whenever people are losing their jobs, they have to figure out a way to bring back food for their families. And black markets are usually the easiest um, and fastest solution. Um, so that was one of the reasons. And then the fact of how we started looking into black, white supremacy for one of our episodes um, and realized that it was very early on that even incidents that we would qualify as lone wolf uh, attacks, like what happened in El Paso at the Walmart where 27 Americans were killed, or what happened in New Zealand or Norway, all these attacks that we're seeing happening around the world more often, um, that they were actually interconnected. So calling them lone wolf attacks could not be more further from the truth. They are connected, they are learning from each other, they're getting inspired by one another, and through our investigation, we found that they're actually going as far as gaining military training from one another. And uh, it just makes us think that we should be paying more attention and we should be doing a lot more to stop this. Um, I also want, would like you to um, talk a little bit about when we talk about, um, you know, connecting <clears throat> and we talk about, uh, you know, empathy, um, I was, really um, moved by hearing Sonia's story in Cocaine Queen, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because like you, she was a mom. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of home motivations came out of the love, the love for her partner. Yeah, I started hearing about women entering the drug trade uh, at right towards the beginning of the pandemic. And a lot for the same reasons, um, because of they lost their jobs. They, a lot of times were single mothers. They had to figure out a way to bring back food for their families and uh, they were turning to black markets. But what surprised me was that a lot of them were not just happy with a low level position, that a lot of them actually were climbing the ladder of the, the drug trade and making it to leadership roles. And as somebody who's been covering the drug trade for so long, this is not something that I'd ever seen. Um, you know, again, I'm very often surrounded by just men. Um, so I was surprised and I knew then and there that this was a story I really wanted to tell. And what I found was that a lot of these women, what is happening in, these, in, this, in the drug trade in these black markets is sort of a, a, a black mirror or what, of what's happening all around the world, which is a call for equality, which is a fight for equality. So these women that for so many years had seen uh, in places like Colombia, the coca fields of Colombia, or the favelas, the slums that are, you know, overran by the drug trade in Rio, that they often saw how men were bringing, were making so much money and had all these extra opportunities just because they were men. Yes, in the black market. And yes, it's not something that we should condone, absolutely not. But you know what, if you're growing up in places in Colombia, and if you're growing up in places in, in the favelas of Rio, the black market is the only job provider. And so women started saying, you know what, why is he allowed and I'm not? Why is, if I have a gun I'm con and I'm a mother, I'm considered bad person. But if I'm a man and I have a gun, I'm considered, you know, sexy or all these women want to date me. And they, like we do as women in general, found that that was unfair. Uh, and so they started trying to figure out a way, you know, shooting themselves, sh shooting uh, themselves all over the, the glass ceiling, uh, shooting through the glass ceiling um, to, to get to those positions. And then I met, eventually met a woman like Sonia, who was the leader of this uh, drug cart, one of the leaders of this drug cartel in Colombia called Los Caparos, um, who had gotten into a drug, uh, into this uh, black market, into the drug trade, 
the cocaine trade because her father had been killed and she when she was 12 years old and she wanted revenge so she wanted to learn how to uh, use a gun and how to go after the people that had killed her father. And then when she was 16, she met the love of her life, as she says it, who was one of the members of this cartel. And because of her love for him, she decided she wanted to join that group. And she eventually went on to do horrific things, uh, like kill innocent people and kidnap teens to recruit them uh, for the, the cartel. Um, and, you know, there was very much I felt that she was very unapologetic um, about it in a very cold way that I wasn't expecting. Um, and it was hard. It was definitely hard because again, I'm constantly trying to find that connection. But at the same time, if you hear her story and her background, um, I think what is most important for all of us is again, to try not to immediately judge, but try to think and ask the question, what if it would have been me? What choices would I have made? <laughs> So on the theme of love, uh, one of the things that you had said is that during the pandemic, uh, these romantic scams shot up 300%. And we know next month we'll be dealing with, you know, Valentine's Day. Uh, can you talk about that? <laughs> yes, I love that episode. Uh, you know, um, because it was just such a box of surprises. I had no idea that this was happening and it happened. It was happening at the scale that it was. It was a, a it's a crime romance scamming that very much sort of grew out of the pandemic. It grew by 300% and it was scammers who were exploiting sort of the loneliness that we all felt during the pandemic. And uh, uh, so we sp spoke to several, uh, mainly women here in the United States who had fallen victim to these romance scams where they thought they found the man of their dreams, but instead they were talking to a scammer in West Africa. And they at one point started giving them money. And we spoke to women who were professionals, who owned companies, who had saved you know, money and ended up giving over a million, over $2 million to these scammers. Um, and then what was fascinating when we tra actually traveled to Ghana and got to meet these scammers was, uh, you know, seeing from the inside who's doing this, how they operate, but also how a lot of them are actually scamming men. Uh, I'd say the majority of the people we met were scamming men, and yet men were not comfortable with talking to us um, in the United States, the victims. I think there's an extra shame associated with the fact that they thought they were talking to a woman and in fact, they were talking to a man uh, in West Africa. Or there's, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but I was surprised and shocked to see, to find out that a lot of them were men. And then, yeah, talking to these cameras was, and seeing their whole operation was just fascinating. Just fascinating. And of course, you know, sad at the same time. So um, Lisa, Amory, I'm gonna bring you back on because I know um, we have a lot of questions from Mariana. Lisa, take it away. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us, Mariana. And thank you everybody um, who's been chatting and sending us questions. Um, I dropped our social handles and also Mariana's social handles in the chat earlier. So if you wanna give us any feedback or let us know that you're posting, uh, please do that. But yeah, so we got some, um, audience questions in. I'm going to start with this one from Lena, who asked, how often are you scared when entering into these various situations? And how do you move past that initial fear? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Lena, is her name Lena? Lena, Lena. Uh, I, um, there's a funny thing that happens in my mind, which is uh, this sort of battle between fear and curiosity and curiosity always wins. So whenever I'm in a situation where I'm thinking, is it a good idea to go there or not? Um, you know, my curiosity sort of takes over and, and sometimes that's a good thing. And, and sometimes it puts me in sort of sticky situations, but, you know, I do have a lot of experience reporting on these worlds and obviously, you know, no life, uh, no story is worth a life. So there's a lot of work in terms of security planning and procedures and training that goes into place to make sure that we're minimizing the risk always and as much as possible. That's great. And that actually transitions well into this question from Karen, who asked, um, do you have armed security when you go into these dangerous interviews? Some places, sometimes um, we are asked uh, by our bosses to take armed security. But you know what? I actually, one thing I've learned in my reporting and the work that I do is that taking armed security can sometimes be detrimental. It's when 
the best uh, sort of uh, tool that I have at my disposal, again, is showing people that I respect them, that I'm treating them with dignity, that I am not there to judge them. So if I show up with a group of armed men behind me, I am sending and giving the wrong message. I am telling them, I am afraid of you and I don't trust you. And therefore, why should you trust me and why should you not be afraid of me? So it, it is counterproductive sometimes. But you know, we do not go to these places um, without a lot of knowledge and without their permission. You know, we don't show up in, Car in Sinaloa without having spoken to people in the Sinaloa cartel to make sure that we're allowed in. So that goes obviously a long way. That's wonderful. I love the level of uh, empathy that you show with every, every situation. Um, this one comes from Vivian and she wants to know, um, how do you find the topics of your episodes and choose them? Um, it's uh, usually sort of a mix of what is uh, relevant um, and what is what, what actually you would be able to gain access to. Uh, there's a lot of stories out there that we're still trying to gain access to. I say that we're constantly working on like 20 or a list of 20 future story ideas that we're still working, plus the 10 stories per season that we're sort of working on at the same time. Um, and funny, funny thing happened after the uh, airing of season one is that we got, we gained a lot of fans, a lot of people that actually operate in these black markets and that have messaged me wanting me to be a part or to come and film with them or to sort of shine a light into the black markets that they operate in, which is really fascinating. It is fascinating. Wow, that's amazing that people are um, reaching out to you. Um, this one also comes from Karen. Um, she wants to know, do you publish what you learn even if it doesn't make it to the full um, TV episode? And also wants to let you know that she's addicted to your reports and loves watching each episode. Oh, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. What's her name again? This is from Karen. Karen. Oh, Karen, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, uh, yes, you know, there's so much. We film you know, hundreds of hours of television for each episode. And a lot of it ends up on the cutting room floor. Uh, uh, you know, you have to make decisions. There are some moments that we really love that we think are great, um, but that just don't, don't make it into the story. Um, we, I do believe there are some web extras online sometimes. And what I do is that I'm very active on my social media. And so I'm constantly trying to give people behind the scenes uh, and, uh, you know, content that you won't get on the episode. That's fantastic. Um, and I just want everyone to know that I also just dropped links to the Nat Geo link for where you can watch and also the link on Hulu where you can stream past episodes and everything like that. Um, this also comes from an anonymous audience member, but wants to know what can we expect from season three? Um, any sneak peeks? Um, they're just super excited to know what's next. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you too much or else uh, I'm going to be killed. Just kidding. Um, you know, there's a lot of great episodes going, you know, again, we're still living in this pandemic and there are uh, black markets, new black markets popping up all around us constantly. Um, and so we're still doing stories about drugs and guns and the, uh, the things that we always cover for traffic, but there are definitely a lot of episodes this season as well, the season three, which will air next year, um, that are sort of unexpected, um, but, you know, that I, I hope people will learn a lot from. And that, you know, things that you realize, wow, this has happened to me and I never knew that this is why it was happening or who was on the other side of, of this uh, of this crime. Amazing, thank you so much, Mariana. I think we're going to um, unfortunately have to close our audience questions and I'll hand it back over to Madeline. Thank you everyone so much for having me. Thank you so much, Lisa. Absolutely, well, uh, Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. Again, the series is so riveting. Uh, we're so grateful to Nat Geo. Uh, to keep the series going. We're really excited for season three. Hopefully we'll be able to do this again with you. And for our audience, I do wanna mention that we do have another influencer screening happening uh, next week. So please, we hope you will join us for uh, Prayers for the Stolen. And again, Mariana, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Gabe Gomez. And thank you to everybody who took the time today to join us. Thank you so much for having me, Madeline.